I have stabbed myself and I killed my two children. You stabbed yourself and killed your two children? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what's your name? Brandy Worley. And where are, they, where are the children at? In my daughter's room on the in, floor. In your daughter's room on the floor? Okay. And, and what caused you to do this today? My husband wanted a divorce and wanted to take my kid. I won't let him have my kid. Okay, and how old are your children? Seven and three. Seven and three? Okay. And where did you stab yourself at? In the neck. Okay, are you bleeding? Yeah, there's blood everywhere. Okay, and where are you at? In my living room. You're in your living room? Mm-hmm. Okay, and are you, are you armed now with the knife still? No, it's in my children's room. Okay, where's your husband at? Downstairs somewhere. Okay, what's his condition? I don't know, I haven't talked to him. And when you say downstairs, is he in a basement or? Yeah. Okay, what's his name? Uh, Jason. Jason? Jason Morley? Yeah. Okay. And do you have any other weapons with you? Yeah, no. No? Okay. And are you, what are you feeling right now? I mean, are you, are you, are you tired? Are you, where? Yeah, I took, I took a lot of. You took a lot of. Yeah. Okay. Is is the front door unlocked? No, we don't use it. You know, you just use the back door? Yeah. Side is, it's on the side. It's unlocked. Okay. And is there anyone else in the residence besides your children and you and your husband? Um, I called my mom. You called your mom? What did she say? I hang up and call 911. She'd be here in a second. Why did Brandy Worley, cheerful and an outgoing mother, wife, and former teacher, wind up murdering her two children and attempting suicide? I'm Mac and this is Killer Bites. This case took place back in November of 2016. It's enough to make you consider if someone has an alleged history of mental illness, do they deserve a lighter sentence for murdering their kids? Some people think so. Before you decide, you might want to hear the wild details. Brandy Worley was born in 1986 in Indianapolis, Indiana, but she was raised in Crawfordsville, Indiana with her younger sister. Her parents got divorced when she was younger, but this had no negative effect on her development. Not saying it's impossible, but I imagine seeing her parents' divorce affected her on some level. Throughout her childhood and adult life, she was known for being friendly and well-liked. In high school, she was involved in extracurricular activities. Brandy met her husband, Jason, in high school back in 2001. Brandy and Jason then got married in 2009, and they settled in the town of Darlington outside of Indianapolis. They eventually had two children, a son, Tyler, and daughter, Charlie. Sweet, right? Well, she graduated from college with a degree in elementary education and worked as a teacher for a number of years before becoming a stay-at-home mother. Neither Brandy nor Jason could have imagined what their future held. Everything seemed fine until things took a horrific turn. On November 17, 2016, 911 received a phone call from Brandy. Brandy, in a cold and calm voice, told Dispatch that she just killed her two children and stabbed herself. Although Dispatch does a great job at keeping his cool, if you can listen close enough, you can hear the disbelief in his voice when he confirms what Brandy had just told him. When Dispatch asked her further questions like where her husband was, why she did it, and so on, she continued to answer in an eerily calm manner. Crazy, right? Well, here's the tea on what led up to this unprecedented tragedy. Jason posted on Reddit under the username Jason in Hell about Brandy having an affair with her neighbor. He asked for advice on how to leave her. He'd been putting up with her infidelity for the sake of their two kids, a daughter, Charlie, and a son, Tyler. Jason worked as a software engineer, and in 2015, he had been given a huge assignment. The new assignment had him working 60-hour weeks, which put a strain on the marriage. Jason said he noticed that during that time, in 2015, Brady put a password on her phone. When he confronted her about it, she said it was because she was planning a Father's Day present and didn't want him to ruin the surprise. A week later, she went to him and told him she was feeling guilty about keeping a big secret from him and that she was having their neighbor, a contractor, build a home office for him as a present. Jason noticed Brandy's behavior becoming more and more suspicious. She'd put her phone away when he'd walked into the room. She was always texting and smiling at messages. And when he asked who she was texting, she said nobody. It's doubtful that nobody would be able to keep her attention like that. He went through her phone one day and found texts between her and their neighbor. The texts were sexual and inappropriate. Jason noticed more sneaky behavior from Brandy. She started having her messages automatically deleted from her phone every few days. And when she went out, she turned off her location settings. And at one point, Jason installed anti-theft software on her phone to track her location. But he told her that he was installing antivirus software. He also set up a backup of all of her messages on his computer. 
and one day Jason's mother asked to spend some time with the kids. Brandy jotted them off, which allowed her to have the whole day to herself. With her newfound free time, she tried to meet up with a neighbor, but he was busy with work. It turns out that the neighbor had a girlfriend already, and Brandy, Jason, and the neighbor and girlfriend had all hung out before. Brandy and the neighbor's girlfriend decided to hang out and go see a show while Jason and the neighbor hung out back at the house and watched the kids together. During this time, Jason checked the software he had installed and noticed that Brandy was texting the neighbor. The audacity. The neighbor was sitting right across from Jason. And based on the text, Brandy and the neighbor were trying to plan a time and place to have sex. Even worse, Brandy and the neighbor told each other that they loved each other. And this was obviously hurtful and infuriating to Jason. Jason cited more text where the neighbor told Brandy, you're my girl now. And she responded saying, always have been. The neighbor further responded saying, always will be. Jason said he was so infuriated that he wanted to jump off the couch and hit the neighbor over the head. Can't say I'd blame the guy if he actually did it. Can you imagine seeing those sort of texts between your spouse and a neighbor because you're sitting across the room from them? It's not difficult to understand the pain and hurt Jason was dealing with and why he'd finally had enough. I would have been sick to my stomach personally. But when Brandy and the neighbor's girlfriend got home, Jason confronted them. Brandy denied everything. While the neighbor's girlfriend was in complete shock, Jason showed Brandy the messages. And at this point, Brandy couldn't lie anymore. She admitted that her and the neighbor were texting, but added that it was the first time they had gone that far. This definitely sounds suspect. Jason couldn't prove whether or not Brandy and the neighbor had already had sex, but the intent was there, which was terrible enough. And on account of the infidelity, Jason wanted a divorce. This must have caused panic to set in with Brandy. She switched tactics and started playing victim. She blamed the affair on Jason and the fact that he worked so many hours. I can understand how having a spouse who is constantly busy with work while you watch the kids can be super stressful. However, I don't think the solution is to go and cheat with the neighbor who also has a relationship of their own. It's unfortunate that Brandy began the affair. This was also a good way for her to deflect and take the heat off of herself when she's the one in the wrong. Anyway, Brandy took things even further. She told Jason that if they got a divorce, she'd make sure that he never saw the children again. She expanded on this by saying she would prove he was unfit to take care of them. She even threatened to mention his suicide attempt when he was younger. The fact that Brandy would stoop so low and use such a traumatic and personal event like that against him just to keep him around is actually insane. It's also wild considering the fact that her cheating doesn't make it seem like she wants to stay married to him. It actually says quite the opposite. Maybe she just wanted to have her cake and eat it too. Well, unfortunately, Brandy and Jason didn't divorce at this point, but they did separate. Brandy took their kids with her. And while she had them, she told them awful things about Jason, like saying that he didn't want to be around them anymore. After learning this and seeing what the separation was doing to the kids, Jason decided to stick around for their sakes. There were, however, some stipulations for this. Brandy told Jason that he had to apologize to their neighbor and practically forced him to beg her to stay. Again, the audacity. She was the one in the wrong and Jason had to do the apologizing and groveling? How backwards is that? Jason did all these things and it seemed like everything was going to get back on track. He was sadly mistaken. Months later, Jason caught Brandy sending the neighbor pictures. Jason was devastated. Discovering Brandy's continued infidelity affected Jason's job performance and made him more stressed. Jason updated his post on Reddit with all of this new information and Reddit users told him to get a lawyer and use Brandy's infidelity to get custody of the kids. In November of 2016, Jason updated his post again letting everyone know that he was meeting with an attorney that day. And this was his final post on Reddit before tragedy struck. Jason told Brandy he had officially filed for a divorce. That night, Brandy said she was going to the store to get materials for their son Tyler's school project. But she didn't buy school supplies. She bought a combat knife. Its intended use could never have been guessed. This is proof that the murders were premeditated. And when Brandy returned home, she hid the knife in Tyler's room. The rest of the night went on normally when Brandy and Jason played with Tyler and their daughter Charlie before bed. Sadly, that would be the last time Jason saw his children alive. And in the middle of the night, on November 17th, 2016, Brandy woke Tyler up, saying they were going to have a sleepover in Charlie's room. As Tyler walked out, Brandy grabbed the knife, and when Tyler entered Charlie's room, Brandy straddled him and stabbed him repeatedly in the neck. This woke Charlie up, and she asked what was happening. Brandy told her it was nothing and to go back to sleep and stabbed her repeatedly in the neck as well. Poor Tyler was only seven years old and in elementary school. 
poor little Charlie was three and hadn't started school yet. Such an unnecessary tragedy. And after the kids, Brandy stabbed herself in the neck repeatedly. It was at this point that she called her mother and admitted what she did. Brandy's mother, panicking, said she would be right over. Brandy made another call to 911 and the recording of her telling dispatch what she did is nothing short of chilling. Her tone was calm and distant, as though she did nothing at all. Aside from the murders and her attempted suicide, she also relayed to dispatch that she'd taken a large amount of Benadryl. This entire time, Jason was asleep and completely unaware of what had happened. He woke up to the screams of his mother-in-law, who had arrived and found Brandy and the children covered in blood. When Jason saw everything for himself and looked at his wife, Brandy told him, now you can't take the kids from me. What a cruel and selfish thing to say. Brandy basically had the thought process of, if I can't have them, no one else will. What haunting words to hear after a, such a vicious crime. And by the time EMS arrived at 4.30 in the morning, Charlie and Tyler had died. Brandy told paramedics that she wanted to die with her children as she sat calmly in the living room. Brandy was taken to the hospital and treated for her wound. She recovered fairly quickly. Brandy's trial began in August of 2017. Jason said he never wanted to see Brandy again, and when the judge asked him what he thought Brandy's punishment should be, out of sight, out of mind were his words. Days after the murder, the family released a statement disclosing their shock and grief at losing Tyler and Charlie. The family also thanked the outpouring of love and support from the community, and neighbors and other people in the community said that the kids were sweet and that Brandy was always nice. They said the family as a whole seemed very put together and well-rounded. Days before the murders, one neighbor mentioned that he helped Tyler and Charlie make Brandy a birthday card. Initially, Brandy pleaded not guilty by way of insanity. Her attorneys mentioned her history of anxiety and depression as what helped contribute to the murders. With the insanity plea, she was ordered to undergo a mental evaluation and return the following year for a competency hearing. Brandy then changed her mind and switched her plea to guilty. And at her hearing, she was given the option to speak, but chose not to. Ultimately, in March of 2018, she was sentenced to 120 years in prison, 55 years for her son's murder and 65 years for her daughter. The judge who sentenced her mentioned how everyone was trying to find a reason for why a mother would do this to her children. The judge said, Sometimes there's no explanation. Darkness is in this world and it penetrates minds and our hearts. Chilling words, but true ones. It was noted that during Brandy's trial, she was in an emotionless state and showed no remorse for her children's murders. Her defense attorney stated that she showed emotion during their first few meetings and later became stoic. He claimed it was how she was dealing with everything and that she didn't know why she did it. I have my own opinion about why Brandy did it. It was her fear of not just her husband leaving her, but losing custody of her kids. She was afraid of being by herself and was also ashamed of the reasons why. Rather than deal with the consequences of her actions, she decided to take away the things that she and Jason both loved most, their children. The crazy part is her actions still got the outcome she was most afraid of, being by herself. During the trial, Brandy and Jason's divorce were finalized. With all of the madness going on, the community rallied behind Jason. The Darlington community raised $50,000 on a GoFundMe page to assist with the funeral costs for Charlie and Tyler. A funeral was held for them in the Darlington Community Center, and back in June of 2018, Jason posted an update on Reddit under a new username. He mentioned that he tried to use to cope with everything, but thankfully his family and friends kept bottles away from him before he could go too far. At one point, he contemplated suicide. He cited family, friends, and therapy as reasons for improving his mental health and being able to go on. He lost his job at one point in the midst of everything going on, but he eventually got it back and was closer to getting his old position. Brandy's family, meanwhile, had given him a hard time. They kicked him out of the house he and Brandy had been staying in, and he had to get police involved when he tried to get his things back. He also mentioned that some of Brandy's family members would follow him whenever he went to visit the children's graves, so he was unable to visit as frequently as he'd like. Otherwise, he seemed to be taking things a day at a time. Hopefully, Jason continues to heal and has nothing but positivity in his future. This case raises so many questions, particularly pertaining to filicide, which is the name for when a parent murders their child. Brandy's story reminds me of an ongoing similar case regarding Michelle Kehoe, who killed one of her two sons and attempted suicide after. Michelle made an elaborate plan to blame a stranger for killing her two sons. She didn't expect one of her sons to survive to tell the story of what really happened. On the morning of October 27, 2008, Iowa police found a seven-year-old boy covered in dried blood in a van in a secluded area near a pond. 
The boy's brother lay dead beside the van with a slashed throat. The boy told police that Michelle had duct taped his mouth, eyes, and nose, cut his throat, then his brothers before leaving them for dead. After Michelle left them, she went to a pond nearby and attempted suicide by slashing her own throat. When she realized that she wasn't going to die, she went down the road to the nearest house. Once she arrived, she told the resident a fabricated story of how a stranger abducted her and her boys, killed them, then tried to kill her. When police went looking for the stranger, that's when they found the surviving son, who locked himself in the van overnight. During her trial, Michelle tried to plead insanity, but it was rejected. Ultimately, she was sentenced to life in prison. Just like Brandy, Michelle killed one of her own children, tried to commit suicide, then plead insanity when it was quite obvious she knew what she was doing. It's devastating knowing that not only did a child almost die at the hands of his own mother, but he was there while his younger brother was killed. Another case similar to Brandy's is the one involving Christy Sheets, a Texas mother who shot and killed both of her daughters in 2016. Her daughter, Madison, was 17, and the other daughter, Taylor, was 22. Christy's husband believes that she killed him as a way of hurting him for wanting to divorce her. Christy apparently was very loving and kind and had no history of being violent. She did suffer from mental health issues, though, and spiraled from the death of her grandfather. When the family gathered together in the living room one night, the husband assumed it was to discuss the divorce. Christy wound up pulling out a gun and shot both daughters outside of their home as the husband watched, shocked and horrified. When police arrived, they wound up shooting and killing Christy who refused to put down her gun. One of the daughters died on the scene and the other daughter died later in the hospital. Although Christy died before she could be tried for such an awful crime, the crime itself and the reasoning behind it are very close to Brandy's case. Children dying at the hands of a parent, especially their mom, is so hard to make sense of. It's unfortunate that Christie's husband had to experience something so terrible. Consider another case like Brandy's. The case of 37-year-old Veronica Youngblood, a Virginia mother who murdered her two daughters in 2018. She did this out of revenge for her ex-husband's plan of moving away with one of their daughters. Veronica fatally shot her five-year-old daughter, Brooklyn, in the head. Her other daughter, 15-year-old Sharon, was shot in the back and in the chest and was rushed to the hospital where she eventually died. It was reported that while Sharon lay dying, Veronica called her ex-husband Ron and told him that she hated him and that she'd shot the kids. Veronica had bought a handgun nine days before the shooting. She also gave her daughters sleeping gummies so they wouldn't be able to fight back or escape once she began her attack. During her trial, Veronica pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. She used to be a sex worker and was also sexually abused by her family members growing up which her attorneys used to strengthen her mental illness defense. Insanity pleas seemed to be used as get out of jail free cards. Eventually, Veronica admitted to killing her kids and that she deserved the death penalty. Her trial lasted two weeks and it took the jury one day to declare her guilty. Veronica seems much more volatile than Brandy, but she still killed her children for selfish reasons like Brandy did. One more case like Brandy's is the case of Elaine Campioni an Ontario woman who murdered her two daughters in 2006. She did this out of revenge because she was worried her ex-husband, Leo, would get custody of the girls. Elaine and Leo's daughters were Serena, three years old, and Sophia, 19 months. When the murders took place, Elaine was living in an apartment with the girls and she was in the middle of a bitter divorce and custody battle. Leo alleged that Elaine was keeping the girls in substandard living conditions and that she had a mental health breakdown. It's true that Elaine actually did suffer from mental illness, such as experiencing intense delusions. According to Elaine, however, Leo was abusive to her and their daughters, and he told her that she'd never seen the girls again. On October 2nd, 2006, Elaine killed both of their daughters by drowning them in the bathtub. Elaine even made a video with snippets before the murders and after. In the video, she addressed her husband, after the drownings, Elaine dressed the girls in pajamas and jewelry and posed them on a bed with various objects. After that, she attempted suicide. Elaine's attorney tried to use the insanity plea, but the jury found that Elaine knew murder was wrong despite having a mental illness. Elaine was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and convicted in November of 2010. She was sentenced to life in prison. However, in 2019, the Parole Board of Canada began allowing her to have escorted absences from prison. Elaine's marital problems were much different than Brandy's, but what they share is the fact that they both murdered innocent children that they brought into this world. What do you all think? Was Brandy Worley a mother and wife whose battle with anxiety and depression got the best of her? 
Should she have gotten a lighter sentence on account of her mental health? Should she have even gone to jail at all? Would a mental institution have been the more appropriate place to send her? Or did her punishment fit the crime? Do you want us to go into more detail about the other cases mentioned in this episode? The Michelle Kehoe case, the Christy Sheets case, the Veronica Youngblood case, or the Elaine Campioni case? Please let us know any and all of your thoughts in the comments below. Again, I'm Mac, and thanks for watching Killer Bites.